and welcome to my KSP campaign. My name is Mike Aben. Uh, a little bit later in this episode, we will be revisiting our crew that are on their way to Minmus, and we'll also be launching the Karayan 1, which will be a first step in establishing a permanent presence in space for our Kerbals. But right now, we're going to start with something else. Here we have Junksat 3, leaving the pad. This is actually a redo of a mission that I, well, semi-botched. I modified, I suppose might be the best word. From a couple of episodes ago, I launched Junksat 2, which was supposed to go into this orbit, uh, pretty close to the same altitude as the moon's orbit, a little bit inclined. Um, but it's supposed to have a mystery goo container on it, and I forgot a couple of episodes ago to put the mystery goo container, so I ended up swinging that particular satellite in around the moon where it's now acting as a communication relay. So this is now an attempt to actually do this mission for real. I made sure this time it does have a mystery coup uh, container on it, as you can see. This being an inclined orbit, I made sure to launch underneath one of the ascending or descending nodes of my target orbit. Uh, this time under the descending node, I can tell because I'm launching towards the south, more specifically 6.8 degrees towards the south is my heading, so that I will go straight into the inclination that I want, not have to do the inclination change while in space. And, and this whole business is you know pretty routine. Uh, I put myself into low carbon orbit. Once in low carbon orbit, I set a maneuver to take me out to either the apoapsis or periapsis of my target orbit. Uh, whichever one happens to come first. And uh, then I just perform the burn and get myself on out there. Now I do have to be a bit cons or conscious of, not concerned really, but conscious of communication. Um, it's going to take me about, what's that, one day, three hours and 40 minutes to get on out there. I don't have any antennas pointed in that direction. I have antennas pointed to the moon and to Minmus, but not just out into random places in space. So I got to think, okay, that, you know, each of these communication satellites have a period of two hours. So they're each going to do, what, five rotations and about three quarters of another rotation. So I figure ComSat 5 is in a good position to relay out the signal. So I hop on out to ComSat 5, take its spare antenna, and point it at Junksat 3. And then we just time warp out to Apoapsis and complete our circularization, which I did from map view. Normally I like doing this using Kerbal Engineer and watching my satellite, but uh, Engineer was getting all messed up because of moon encounters I kept getting, and I wasn't getting reliable periapsis and Apoapsis numbers. So I had to do it from map view, but that's okay. And there we go. Requirements go green. We had stability for 10 seconds. We're done. Now it's time to go on to part two of this mission and see if I can finagle this particular satellite into an orbit around the moon. So we'll select the moon as a target. And you can see there is this place where the two orbits come very, very close together. That's where I'm going to shoot for my encounter. Now you can already see those close encounter integrators on opposite sides of the orbit. So that's about as bad as you can get. But the place for us to do our maneuver is going to be on the opposite side from where we're shooting for our encounter. So we'll add a maneuver node here, and uh, we'll give ourselves just a little bit of prograde. It doesn't mean that, just, just to have something happening, and then we'll just hop ahead in orbit. So let's hop ahead one orbit, two orbits, three orbits. That's too far, so we'll come back. No, 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 that's playing around with the program. No, i got to come back in orbit. And now I'm going to play around see if I can get those encounters to get in pretty close. So I can, taking a look at where the ascending node is, I'm going to put the two encounter indicators on equal sides of that ascending node. And then I'm going to burn radially and see if I can pull those together. No, put that back. Radial. We'll start to see if we can pull. There's, there we go. There's our encounter. Well, that's weird. It's looking like I already have an orbit. Uh, yeah. Let's let's focus on the moon here. Let's see what we got. It is saying I'm going straight into an orbit around the moon. I mean, I know because these two orbits, the orbit of the satellite and the orbit of the moon, are very very close to each other. 
I know that the encounter speed, the relative velocity when the probe gets to where the moon is, is going to be very, very low. But there is going to be an encounter speed. There's going to be some speed that is going to enter into the moon's sphere of influence, and that means it'll come out with the same speed. It's symmetrical. It shouldn't just go into an orbit like this. You know, Mr. Newton might have something to say about this. I think KSP is just a little bit confused. But what I'll do is I, I will, you know, I'll keep this maneuver the way it is for now, and then I will just set a uh, alarm clock. I'll set an alarm for it. And although uh, I really do think that KSP is confused here, oh wow, this alarm's going to be more than 21 days away. Huh? Oh well. <laughs> I do think KSP is confused here. One thing for sure, I think this is going to be my cheapest capture ever. And then came time for some time warping. First, to the completion of the Research and Development Center. So that will unlock the next couple of tiers on the uh, tech tree. Then, time warped until the completion of the runway. No more lumpy sand to be uh, taking off from. And then finally, time warping to the completion of the Karayan 1. This thing has been in the building queue for a long, long time. It is time to get this thing off the ground. All right, let's roll her out. Ooh, that's gonna take well over a day. By then, MAPSAT 2 is going to be completed, so I'd best push something else out into the building queue. In addition, only 20 minutes after that, uh, our Minmus crew will be entering into the sphere of influence of Minmus. That's a little bit... I don't, wanna, I don't want them to cross through the sphere of influence without me make, making them the focus vessel. I always... I always find that a little sketchy, so I think it'd be best if we went out and dealt with them first. Okay, so you can see here we're about an hour, a day and two hours away. Well, there's Minmus. We can now see its disk. Yeah, our target is in sight. Let's see what Kerbin looks like. Rolling around from the way we came. Where's it? There's Kerbin. We are a long way from home. Yeah. All right. Well, nothing to it. Let's, let's get this time warping out of the way. Get her done. Oh, I'm in miss getting bigger. You know, despite being out in space for over 10 days, our crew seems pretty pleased with themselves. Very happy. Oh, I like the disco. I always, there's a, when you're at five times speed, you always get this sort of disco light effect with the blinking lights in the cockpit. It always looks great. All right, we are there. So get our contracts ready. We have two contracts. One is to just do a flyby of Minmus, and the other is to finally finish off this big tourist contract with doing a flyby of Minmus with Alil here. That's why she's along. Of course, Carol is our scientist. She'll be collecting the science, and Bill is there in case anything breaks. Not that Bill can fix too much. I guess Bill's mostly there just to get some freaking experience into him. All right. So our contracts are complete. All we have to do is get these folks back home. And to be honest, I probably, I, I think I, I have enough Delta V to, to get a capture, hang around for a little bit, and then break orbit and still come back. I'm pretty, yeah, I'm sure of it. But uh, uh, I'm not going to do that. I mean, I, I think I mentioned last episode, these, I don't want, Still going to be a couple of, you know, they still got probably a little less than a week to get them home. They'll be getting home a little faster than uh, their route there. And, you know, I th honestly, uh, yeah, that's enough to be stuck in a can. So I want to get them home as quickly as possible. So what we'll do is we'll just do a little bit of radial inburn. We won't set up a maneuver node or anything like that. We'll just point radially in. And just sort of do a few.
you I won't use RCS and I want to spend as much time as I can close to Minmus that's good enough so now comes time for us to set up our maneuver to get these folks back home so we'll add a maneuver we'll we'll click it on to periapsis with Minmus and what I want to take a look at, of course, is my periaps of the Kerbin and get it down into the atmosphere. And you might recall from my moon flyby that I did run into a little bit of an issue. And it had to do with ejection angle. So I'm playing with actually the time. And I found if I did it a little bit be below, before periapsis with Minmus, uh, I could get my periapsis with Kerbin down more efficiently. And then... That has to do with the ejection angle getting out of Minmus's sphere of influence. Uh, so yeah, you don't necessarily want it right at periapsis. And just played around with it just a little bit. It was just a little bit before periapsis, only like a minute or two. Um, but I ended up with a burn that's 49 meters per second to get these folks back home. They'll be home in just a little over six days. Uh, yeah, so that's got me pretty happy and then of course comes time to start collecting science and this time what we'll be doing is we'll be transmitting as much of the science as we can I'll transmit that crew report later I just sort of forgot to hit the transmit button so yeah we're gonna transmit because the reason is is because I've just got the research and development center I want and these guys still won't be back for uh, six days so I want to see if I can get some things unlocked before these folks are returning. Uh, you know, I'm thinking back to that maneuver. I always thought I had that flyby maneuver down cold and learn something new. You know, and that's one of the things I love about this game is that no matter how much you play, there's always more things to learn. Anyway, of course, Carol's going to go out there, do some EVAs, and uh, collect some science. But rather than watching you or having you watch her collect science, which you've seen not her, but other people do so many times. I'm going to instead talk about this EVA Enhancements mod. Okay, so what I've done is I've put, I pushed T to put on SAS, and I've rotated her around. I'm doing that with the Q and the E keys. You can do a little rotation. I don't think she's enjoying this, but you, let's see if we spin her around this way. <laughs> So that's done with the two and the X buttons, that spin around button. So, and you can remap these, by the way, rebind them to different keys. But I, I like that. So the putting on SAS, well, first of all, you notice you do have the nav ball during EVA, which in itself is great. Um, putting on SAS kind of changes the camera so it's not this uh, lock at their back view all the time. You can have a little bit more fun, do a few more interesting things. And I think it does make your Kerbals a little more maneuverable while out in space. Anyway, we'll be coming back to these guys next episode for their actual flyby. Right now, it's time to visit Stumpy here. I mean, the Karayan one. <laughs> Weighing in at just over 125 tons, this is easily my biggest vessel yet. And the purpose of this vessel is to be my first manned vessel to go into space and stay there. The idea is this is going to continue to be reused. I'll go up, I'll refuel it, I'll restock it, and I'm going to keep it manned all the time. So this is the beginning of our a continual purple presence in space. And this should be a pretty practical vehicle for me. And because it's going to be in space, well, as long until I get bored of it, I suppose, um, I kitted it out with everything I could possibly think of, except a Kerbal Engineer chip. <laughs> if you notice, I have no Kerbal Engineer data uh, being provided to me. So, yeah, that was a bit of an oversight, but thanks to Kerbal Attachment Systems and Kerbal Inventory Systems, it should be something that should be able to be rectified in the near future. The other thing to notice about this particular vessel is right now it is completely unmanned. Um, the reason for that? Well, because it really has no way to get back down. It has no heat shields, it has no parachutes, it has nothing like that. It doesn't even have a launch abort system. So if I launched it with Kerbals in it, which I could have done, and something went wrong, uh, those Kerbals are dead. So I thought things would be 
much more prudent to launch this thing unmanned, then launch a separate vehicle, likely the Kerstock 5. I'll use that as my sort of, uh, you know, get into orbit vehicle, and then put some Kerbals in it. There we go. Lose those for, oop, a little bit of a touch there. That's okay. Those will still be recovered later. Uh, the vehicle itself is underneath this big fairing. Uh, and, you know, I've been... I complained earlier in this series about the stock fairings and the way they kind of explode as they come off, but I gotta be honest, when they're bigger, yeah, I have to say that's that's pretty cool. Very nice. Anyway, now you can get a look at the vehicle itself, but before I start talking about the vehicle, I need to find me a communitron. Somewhere in here, I have a communitron antenna, and I need to find it before I lose contact with the Kerbal Space Center. There it is, I see it. Tucked away under here, so we'll activate that. All right, with that accomplished, let's talk a little bit more about the vehicle. Um, it can house up to four Kerbals, though I'll probably keep less than that in there most of the time because I'll be keeping them up here for pretty good lengths of time. It has enough life support to uh, keep two Kerbals going for a few months at a time without resupply. It has enough Delta V to get pretty much anywhere within the Kerbal system. I can go and put myself into an orbit around the Moon or an orbit around Minmus uh, and get back to low orbit around Kerbin. I can get into most orbits uh, within the Kerbin system. Some pretty crazy high orbits I might have some issues with. But uh, for the most part, yeah, I, I should be able to get this thing pretty much anywhere I need it to go. But for now, the only place I need it to go to is into a circular orbit with an altitude of about 120 kilometers. And there, I'm going to park it. And then uh, in the near future, we'll launch the Kerstock 5 and we'll crew this thing. All right. So with that accomplished, uh, why don't we light this puppy up? We certainly don't want our future crew to have any trouble finding it and we'll extend the solar panels. There we go. And these are the uh, homegrown rocket panels that are static. They do not rotate. So I need to rotate the vehicle itself so that the panels are well exposed to the sun. And we'll go over some of the things I do have on this thing. Right here in the middle here, oh wait, I also have this uh, radiator. This is a stock radiator. It's probably a bit overkill. I could have gone with a smaller one, but wow, looks good. <laughs> uh, and right here what we have is one of these cargo clamps. This is a Kerbal Inventory System cargo clamps. No cargo yet, because I haven't unlocked the stuff I want to put up here as cargo, but we will transfer some cargo to it in the future. It's also missing a docking port, which I plan on putting at the front here. Uh, again, Kerbal Attachment Systems should rectify that problem, but the, the issue is is that I did not have the docking ports unlocked at the time uh, construction on this thing started. But overall, yeah, pretty happy with this thing. A little time warp over to the other side of the planet, complete our circularization, and then I got one more little trick. I want to get the inclination right down to zero. Without Kerbal Engineer, though, I don't have anything telling me my inclination directly. So the trick here is to select the moon as a target. That gives you your ascending and descending node relative to the moon's orbit, which of course has an inclination of zero. And you can then just time warp to one of the nodes here, burn in the appropriate normal direction until your inclination is down to zero. And then that's going to be it. So we'll have to leave this guy for now and leave this episode for now. Uh, yeah, that's going to have to end this one. I thank you for watching, and I hope to see you next time.